Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Micah Sagabil. I'm the Senior Director of Programs at the Philanthropy Roundtable. I want to welcome everyone here who's on our virtual gathering today, and I want to welcome you all to our afternoon session, which is titled, What's Next in the Fight for School Choice? So I'm really excited today to welcome four of the nation's top school choice experts uh, from the public policy, legal, and research domains. So we've structured a conversation today really to help you, uh, our funder community, track the latest developments in a quickly changing school choice landscape. So what do we know? Uh, we know that the pandemic uh, has really changed the, the school choice political chessboard. Uh, we also know that 2021 is now recognized as the, the year of school choice with at least 18 states passing some form of new legislation related to school choice. And we also know it's a really disorienting time for funders to know how to help kids and families uh, access the best educational options uh, that provide the best outcomes uh, available for all learners. So our guests today, for me, and I know for most of you all, they really need no introduction. So I'm thrilled to welcome Gerard Robinson, the former Commissioner of Education for Florida and Virginia. He's going to join us both as a content expert, but also as our moderator for the day. And Gerard is currently the Vice President of Education uh, at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation uh, and is in Virginia. So Gerard will be interviewing and asking questions to our esteemed panelists. We have Corey DeAngelis, uh, the National Director of Research at the American Federation for Children, and also well known in the school choice Twitter universe as kind of the, uh, the current reigning king, I think, of school choice Twitter. We have Nina Reese, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, who's been at the helm of the organization since 2013, and comes with a rich background uh, before that. Uh, in, uh, at the Department of Ed uh, and, and Heritage and other places. Michael Bendis is the senior attorney with the Institute for Justice and he leads IJ's educational choice team. Uh, and on this team, he, he oversees a talented group of attorneys who help policymakers design constitutionally defendable uh, ed choice programs. And he's led some of the, the biggest litigation cases in the country on this issue. So their full bios will be available in the chat. Um, there's more that I can speak to in a couple seconds, but I think we all know that we have the nation's best here. And so with that, um, let me welcome Gerard and the rest of our panelists. And Gerard's going to kick us off setting the frame for the conversation and get us underway. Thank you, Michael, for the kind introduction. Let me say hello to your president, uh, your board, and members of the Philanthropy Roundtable. Uh, I'm a friend of the Roundtable and always excited to talk about issues of parental choice across the board. You know, what's so interesting for me as it relates to this conversation about what, what are the next steps is to realize that 30 years ago this month, I began my career in education as a fifth grade school teacher at a private school in Los Angeles called the Marcus Garvey School. And during my time as a fifth grade school teacher, there were two events that occurred that changed not only the, the trajectory of my career, but made me have aha moments about the importance of parental choice. Uh, the first occurred in the fall semester of uh, 1991, where there were three gentlemen, uh, Jim Blue, uh, uh, well, actually it was Jim Blue, was also um, uh, oh, this, uh, Clint Bullock, who's with the Institute for Justice, and a few others who in, my, in fact was Kevin Teasley. They were part of a conversation in the LA area about getting parents and others to sign a petition to get a voucher on the ballot before the California voters in 1993. Well, at that time, I knew really nothing about vouchers. I was unfamiliar with the parental choice program in Milwaukee at the time. Well, Kevin had come to our school, we had a conversation and he said, if we can get parents to sign a petition and it passes, it becomes law, guess what? Students can earn a voucher to go to school. Well, I was automatically signed on to that because I had just lost one of my favorite students. Her parents uh, chose to be a one income household and they weren't able to afford tuition. But that voucher could have made a tremendous difference in that student's life. Well, the voucher initiative uh, did make its way into the ballot, was soundly defeated 70 to 30 percent. And the reasons, of course, against it were they said it was going to take public money from education, it was going to destroy education, and it was going to lead to segregation. That's 1991. At least for me, that was my aha for the private school sector. Well, the second aha moment happened with public charter schools. I was again in a classroom when the Rodney King verdict was announced, which led to over 50 deaths, a billion dollars in property damage, which was then probably still uh, one of the worst uh, riots in American history. Well, that led to me working in state government and helping put together a uh, legislative package 
which wanted to support expanding charter schools, particularly in areas impacted by the riots in 1992. At that time, California was the second state in the nation. First, of course, was Minnesota to start a charter. Well, while, while our bill did not become law, it really created a really interesting conversation, particularly in the South Central Air area, where we met with people one-on-one -on -one and talked about charter schools and what we wanted to do. People were saying then charter schools were going to privatize public education, that they were going to lead to segregation, and that they were only going to take the best and the brightest kids, that low-income kids, students of color, in fact, would not find themselves there. Well, that was 30 years ago. Let's fast forward to today. Right now, we have 26 states plus DC that have private school choice programs, in fact, 55. We have 18 scholarship programs uh, in, the, uh, in the country, well, at least from the state perspective, 1.3 million. We have 13 states plus DC that have a voucher program. We're looking at 1.4 billion invested there. We have 13 states with a special needs scholarship, 629 million there, and six states with an education savings accounts program, 262 million, and that's research coming from the American Federation uh, for Children. As Micah mentioned, 18 states have really pushed forward. Uh, there's a really good article written by uh, Mike McShane, who's the director of education at Ed Choice and appeared in, uh, um, in Forbes magazine. And it really talked about what states were doing. This is what I would say is my third event in my life, where I see an opportunity for us to talk about parental opportunities across the board. A number of families who know me and know my work, who hated vouchers, tax credit scholarships and charters, all of a sudden over the last several months have called me and said, you know what? The charter school down the street is open. Kids are going there. What can we do to get our kids in a charter school? But more importantly, what can we do to learn about more charter schools? I said, very interesting. Today, we have you know, 44 states plus DC, educating 3.3 million children and 7,500 charter schools being educated by at least 219,000 teachers. Well, charter schools are important and they made a tremendous difference. And same thing with our schools in the private sector. So for a funder, I think this is probably one of the best times in the history of our movement for funders to be involved in trying to figure out what to do to help. And to help us do that, we've got three great people today who we're going to have a conversation with as it relates to litigation, as it relates to state policy, and as it relates to charter schools. So I'm going to first of all welcome Michael Bentis, who is a senior attorney with the Institute for Justice, an organization I'd mentioned earlier, uh, who is the lead person for their school choice research. He's going to talk about the litigation efforts that are taking place and what that can mean. So without further ado, we will turn it over to you, Michael. Thanks, Gerard. Um, it's funny you mentioned 30 years ago this month, uh, you started your career in education. 30 years ago this month, IJ opened its doors. Um, and ever since that time, we have been litigating school choice cases across the country. Um, we've litigated dozens of cases. We currently have six active cases going on right now. And I certainly expect that in the coming months, we'll see even more because as has already been mentioned, 2021 was such a banner year for getting new programs adopted. The flip side of that, unfortunately, is, uh, means that uh, there's going to be more challenges by school choice opponents trying to take the opportunity that these programs provide to children away from those children. So we will be ready to defend those pro programs if and when they're challenged. Now, these, these cases that, that we litigate, um, defending programs, involve a whole host of issues. They can be constitutional issues, statutory issues, state issues, uh, federal issues. Uh, I wish I had time to go into all of those today, but you know, I really got to kind of focus on, on what I think has been the issue at the forefront of, of school choice litigation ever since those cases we litigated back in the early 1990s, and that is religion. Um, when school choice was in its infancy, the big unresolved question was whether religious options could be included in school choice programs. School choice opponents argued uh, that they could not be, that if you allowed a family to use their voucher, their scholarship to send their child to a religious school, uh, that somehow constituted a state establishment of religion in violation of the First Amendment. And thankfully, the U.S. Supreme Court roundly rejected that argument in one of our early cases, Zellman versus Simmons-Harris back in 2002. And what the court said was, look, so long as these programs are neutral toward religion, meaning religious and non-religious schools alike are free to participate, 
And so long as the program operates on the private choice of parents, meaning it's parents rather than government deciding what school their child will attend, there is no constitutional impediment whatsoever to the inclusion of religious options in these types of programs. It was a tremendous victory. It really opened, uh, opened the way for, for new choice programs throughout the country. Despite that holding, however, school choice opponents for the last two decades have argued that even if it's permissible to have religious options in these programs, uh, even if that's okay under the federal constitution, state law, specifically state constitutions and state statutes, still require the exclusion of religious options. And they have filed a series of lawsuits throughout the country attacking choice programs and trying to either shut them down or at least expel the religious schools from these programs. To make matters worse, some states have taken it upon themselves to do just that, um, and Maine is one of those states. Um, we are currently litigating a case at the U.S. Supreme Court, a case called Carson versus Macon, uh, that concerns Maine's exclusion of so-called sectarian options from that state's town tuitioning program. And I'll tell you a little bit about the, the program itself. So in, in Maine, if you live in a town that does not operate its own public high school, then the and, and uh, if the town does not contract with a high school to educate its resident students, then the town has to pay tuition for students in the town to attend the public or private school of their parents' choice. That school can be inside of Maine, that school can be outside of Maine, it can even be outside the United States. And the state routinely pays for kids to attend some of the most elite prep schools you can think of across the country. Uh, schools like Avon Old Farms, uh, Miss Porter's, the Taft School. But a student better not dare select a Jewish day school or an Islamic school or the school at their local Catholic parish. And that is because Maine flatly prohibits so-called sectarian schools from the program, specifically schools that teach religion or engage in any kind of religious instruction. Um, now, I certainly hope that seems unconstitutional to you, and, and it is. Uh, in fact, just last year in another IJ case, uh, Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue, the Supreme Court held Montana's exclusion of religious options from its school choice program unconstitutional. The court said that you know, while a state need not subsidize private education, once it decides to do so, it cannot exclude some schools simply because of their religious status, simply because of the fact that they are religious. Now, in light of that decision, you got to think it's pretty clear that Maine's exclusion of religious options is unconstitutional. It was clear to everybody except the First Circuit Court of Appeals, which in October 2020, four months after Espinoza, upheld Maine's exclusion of religious options. And you might be scratching your head thinking, well, how could they do that? Uh, were they just thumbing their nose at the Supreme Court? Well, the First Circuit got crafty. Uh, according to the First Circuit, Espinoza really concerned um, exclusion of schools because of their religious status, simply because of the fact that they are religious. But Maine, according to the First Circuit, isn't doing that. It's not excluding schools because they are religious. It's excluding schools because of the religious use to which they would put a student's tuition benefit, namely providing religious instruction. In the First Circuit's mind, this is somehow a distinction with a constitutional difference. Uh, the court fully recognizes that you can't exclude, cannot exclude schools because they are religious, but according to the First Circuit, a state is perfectly free to exclude schools because they do religious stuff like teach religion. Um, that should be deeply disturbing. Uh, you can, you can this so-called status use distinction as it's now become known, uh, you can describe it in many ways. You get hair splitting, sophistry, absurdity. It's all of these things, right? Um, first of all, whether you describe something as turning on religious status or religious use is really just a matter of how you frame the question, right? You can ask, is the state discriminating against Lutherans? or is it discriminating, discriminating against people who do Lutheran stuff? It's the same discrimination either way. And it's not as if the First Amendment or the US Constitution cares. The, the Free Exercise Clause, after all, protects exercise. Certainly, it protects your right to be Catholic or Jewish or Islamic, but it also protects your right to act on your beliefs. It protects the right of schools to teach religion and the right of parents to choose schools that teach religion for their children. 
So we asked the US Supreme Court to take up this case. And in July, it agreed to hear the case. And we are now in uh, the middle of briefing. We expect that the case will be argued in late November or December of this year. And we are very confident that the court will see this case our way uh, and that the court will hold that no matter how a state couches its exclusion, its discrimination, you know, whether it's targeted at religious use or religious status, it's religious discrimination either way and it's unconstitutional either way. Thank you so much. So now it's time to turn to Corey DeAngelis, who's the Director of Research at the American Federation of Children, to talk to us about state policy efforts and updates. Yeah, thank you so much, Gerard. Uh, I put into the chat a link from the American Federation for Children website of something we call the Year of School Choice. We're calling 2021 the Year of School Choice because 18 or 19 states now this year alone have enacted or expanded programs to fund students as opposed to systems. What's great about this past year is that families have started to figure out that there isn't any good reason to fund closed, failing institutions when you can fund the student directly instead. The way that I put it before is that COVID didn't break the public school system. In a lot of ways, it was already broken. That from the get-go, private schools were fighting to reopen or fighting to remain open and provide services to their customers, whereas the government schools were fighting for the opposite. And I don't think the difference there was one of motivations or intentions. I think the difference was one of incentives, that one of these sectors received children's education dollars regardless of whether they opened their doors for business. So if you look at the latest Real Clear Opinion Research polling, nationwide, there's been a 10 percentage point jump in support for what I call funding students as opposed to systems, or what most people call school choice, from 64% support in favor of school choice in April of 2020 to 74% support in favor of school choice nationwide among the general public in June of 2021. And some of the biggest jumps in support were one among families who had kids in the public school system. I think that's largely because families started to see that they needed exit options. Even if they liked their public school, they started to see this big problem that was an inherent inherent in that current system, which was a massive power imbalance between the teachers union monopoly and individual families. Families don't wanna feel powerless ever again. Even if they do want to keep their public school going forward, they don't wanna feel like they did in 2020 and 2021, where they were scrambling for, for options, fighting for virtual charter schools, fighting for other types of institutions like private schools or homeschooling pandemic pods, and then not being able to afford uh, the private options out of pocket. More advantaged families were able to do so, or at least more likely to be able to do so, which led to huge inequities over the past year, year and a half. But then families started to see that the money associated with educating their child stayed in the closed institutions while they were left scrambling for alternatives. So start, families started to realize that, well, if their grocery store didn't reopen, they could take their family's grocery money elsewhere. If their school didn't reopen, they should have been able to take their children's education dollars elsewhere. And I think this started to click for more and more people that we already do this with so many other taxpayer funded initiatives. With higher education, for example, we have the Pell Grant for low income students. The money goes to the student and then they can choose public or private religious or non-religious universities that work for them. Same thing with pre-K programs, including the federal Head Start program. The money doesn't go to a residentially assigned government-run provider of pre-K services. Instead, and rightfully so, the money goes to the family and they can typically choose between public or private, religious or non-religious providers of pre-K services. We do the same thing with food stamps. You can take the money to Walmart or Trader Joe's or Safeway or another provider of the service instead of the money going directly to one institution over the other. All I'm arguing for, and a lot of people on this call have argued for, is that the money, we should apply the same logic to K-12 education and fund students, not systems or buildings or institutions. And so this has been a huge year. I sent you a link on the victories in 18 or 19 states. Some of those examples were from states like West Virginia. This was I think most groups are calling West Virginia the biggest year of 20, the, the, the biggest expansion uh, in, in favor of educational freedom in 2021, because 
West Virginia essentially went from zero to 100 real quick when it came to school choice. They didn't have any charter schools on the ground in West Virginia just a couple of years ago. They didn't have any private school choice programs, but then they just enacted the most expansive education savings account program in the nation. And the number of states this past year with education savings account pro programs in place actually doubled from five states to 10 states with education savings account programs. If you're not familiar with what this actually is, I would call it the purest form of funding students, not systems, because it's kind of like the voucher idea where the funding follows the child to a private school if they would like to spend it on tuition and fees instead of their geographically assigned government run school. But with the education savings account program, it allows for maximum flexibility on the part of the parent where the money that would have followed the child to their traditional school would follow them to an education savings account that they can then use to pay for private school tuition and fees like the voucher idea, but they could also use it to pay for uh, pandemic pods and micro schools, tutoring, textbooks, any approved education provider of their choosing. Uh, and th there was a ton of these states that had these types of bills introduced this past year as well. New Hampshire was another huge victory. They have what I believe we're calling the second most expansive education savings account program in the country that they just passed. And then third, we have Kentucky as well, another education savings account, which will be the third most expansive education savings account program in the nation. So there's uh, just huge wins all across the country. I'm also about to paste into the chat. Um, there's also a blog by Jason Bedrick, who's over at Education Next, and he wrote an article estimating the number of students that will be able to access these types of programs this year. His article is called, How Big Was the Year of Educational Choice? And I put it into the chat just now, but he estimates that about 1.6 million additional students will be able to use school choice this coming year. Um, and 3.6 million additional students will be eligible based on income or whatever the uh, eligibility threshold may be in that state this, this year. So we're calling it the year of school choice or educational choice, or if you're really hip with the lingo, the year of that we fund students, not systems. Um, something else that's been interesting over this past year is that people have started to see a lot of different types of one size fits all problems in the traditional school system. And that comes in various different forms. One form could be the type of curriculum that's in your public school. For all the bad that was associated with remote learning in terms of math and reading learning loss, families got to see a little bit of what was going on in the classroom. And some families liked it, some families did not. And there have been a lot of battles at school boards over the past year, year and a half, because of these disagreements about curriculum in the classroom. And a lot of families are starting to turn towards school choice as a solution uh, to these one size fits all pro problems. Another one being mask mandates in your school. Some people like to have uh, universal masking in the school setting. Some families may want the individual parents to, to have that decision for their individual kids. So some states, in, including Florida and Arizona, have enacted programs to fund students directly through a voucher or an education savings account um, for families that disagree with the masking policy in their public school. So two states that have done this are Florida and Arizona already. And there have been talks about certain types of programs to fund students directly if families disagree with the curriculum in their public school. I think both of these things are a step in the right direction towards empowering more families to choose the school or education provider that works best for them. But look, masking and curriculum are only a couple of the disagreements and, and reasons why we need to have individual choices and, and to not force one size fits all mandates on other people's kids. And it, it's, it makes me optimistic that people are seeing the problems with the one size fits all system and turning towards freedom and choice as the solution to all of these things instead of turning towards force where we uh, put other people's kids into a system that doesn't align with their parents' values. We shouldn't feel compelled to force other people's kids to, to be in an environment that doesn't align with their values. So let's... Uh, Again, look, this is the year of school choice. 
Uh, and one of the best parts about it is that I think it's because of the teachers union's own doing. They've overplayed their own hand and they've inadvertently done more to advance the concept of educational freedom than anyone could have ever imagined. So we should really present them with an award for being the 2021 School Choice Advocates of the Year, although unintentionally. Thank you, Corey. And now we're gonna to turn to Nina, who's the uh, President and CEO of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools to talk about the opportunities and the barriers. Welcome. Great, thank, thank you so much, Gerard. And thank you also to Micah and the Philanthropy Roundtable for inviting me to be on this panel. Sorry that we're not in person in San Antonio. Gerard, you mentioned 30 years ago, I too was introduced to the choice movement through that ballot measure. And uh, interestingly enough, 30 years ago, um, this year, uh, the Minnesota Charter School uh, Program was enacted into law, so it was the very first charter law. So uh, we've been um, kind of fighting and making the case for all the uh, myths that were kind of permeating the space back then ever since. Uh, you threw out some numbers, but it's worth repeating that we now have charter laws in 45 states. Uh, we have 3.3 million students in charter schools, uh, over 7,500 charter schools around the country. Uh, and what's um, really interesting based on uh, everything that Corey just mentioned is the uptick in enrollment in charter schools in the last school year. We're about to release a report next week which highlights the numbers by state. We have data from 42 states from their state education agencies, which gives us confidence that there was something going on in our, in our space that attracted families to them. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that we're taking good care of them so that those numbers remain high and continue going up. Um, I think you wanted me to talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities. I'll start with the opportunities. Um, first and foremost, look, I, I, I agree with everyone in that this is the year um, that, you know, we need to kind of put the pedal to the metal and make sure we're moving forward as fast as possible and making the case for charter schools and choice options uh, as aggressively as possible because we have all these families who for the first time in many instances uh, decided to explore their options. So whether it was to hire a teacher from their schools to create a pod, to transferring their kids to a charter school, uh, to whatever else that they did for the first time, a good portion of families who never think about choice in charter schools were involved in this exercise and we need to leverage their enthusiasm and interest in, in uh, in what we have to offer. Uh, the other thing for us specifically is that if there was ever a time um, where the charter model demonstrated that having principals at the helm making decisions on the fly uh, with the power to move dollars around and make decisions quickly is better than having one size fits all systems making those decisions last year was a perfect example. I live here in Fairfax County. Everyone saw the articles that came out of Fairfax County, uh, the slow nature uh, with which the system hired an outside provider to do virtual uh, learning and all fell apart first day of school. How, you know, how, um, you know, again, in this neighborhood, people really don't talk about options because they've already made a choice to move into our neighborhood. We have signs all over about, you know, Fairfax County, open your schools and whatnot. So um, our sector, uh, by contrast, responded quickly and effectively. So you, whether you were a well-funded charter management organization that had the resources and the philanthropic support to offer Chromebooks to all your kids, as some networks like Breakthrough in Cleveland were able to do, they now have two Chromebooks for, for their kids, one to stay at the school and one for, them to, for the kids to take home. Um, whether you were a network like that or whether you're a single site um, like Earl Fallon, Fallon Academies, he's not a single site, but he's a smaller network. He called me the first week after the pandemic hit or when the schools were closed to say, look, I'm making grab and go packs and homework packets available for anyone who wants to swing by the school to pick them up. If they're not picking them up, I'm taking it door to door to their homes. So that spirit was alive and well when the pandemic hit and demonstrated, again, that the nimble nature of our enterprise is better than one size fits all systems, but also uh, that something about mixing the power of choice where you're accountable to families with accountability to an authorizer ends up producing a better result. Um, the other thing I would just also mention is um, 
and I know this is a conservative setting, but at the federal level, they have made more money available to school systems than the school system arguably know what to do with. So when the pandemic first hit, they made $13.5 billion available for K-12 schools. I thought that was a big number. This was March of 2020. December of 2020, that number went to 50 billion. Mind you, these passed when Trump was in office. This year in March again, uh, Congress and the administration signed into law another package, $121 billion. And so when you add all of this up, the school districts have a lot of money to spend through the year 2024, and there's huge flexibility in how they are using this money. And so why do I mention this? We, I think we have a very kind of small, narrow window of time to make sure, because you know, when you have all these dollars, the argument that charters are taking public dollars away from public schools goes away to some extent, but it doesn't mean that argument is not gonna come back. So we have a huge responsibility and a narrow window of time to really continue to make sure people understand the value of choices, options, and public charter schools, but to also go above and beyond, because in many instances, we too are getting this money in a flexible way, to demonstrate that what we do is producing better outcomes, that we can stretch the dollar farther, uh, and that at the end of the day, we are spending this money more wisely, because you know that some of it is not going to be spent properly in the in these larger bureaucracies. So, um, so on the challenge front, um, you know, as I said, so the money is going to dry up. So we have to be ready for the next fights. The the unions remain powerful. I understand, uh, Corey. I agree with you that this year, huge momentum in our favor. But at the end of the day. You know, a lot of uh, people still don't know what a charter school is, but they know who their teachers are and to the extent teachers are connected to the unions in any way, shape or form. We believe that we have to make sure um, we are um, not, you know, making this a fight against teachers, but a fight about making sure parents have options and that teachers are truly given the power and autonomy to run their schools as they wish so that they're not waiting for a bureaucrat in a distant office telling them how to run their schools and classrooms. Um, the other thing that concerns me personally, it's been something that's been around for quite some time. It doesn't just um, hit our issue, it hits a whole, whole host of other issues. It's just a fragmentation of both parties to the left and to the right. Um, you know, charter schools were born from bipartisan support. They continue to enjoy huge bipartisan support in every state where they have thrived. Uh, but if, you know, these parties keep fraying and the center of both parties keeps thinning out, uh, that is a problem because, you know, ultimately you need to make sure that people are coming together to agree on certain concepts. Charters are still in the public sphere uh, and they need to spend, they need to stay in that sphere if we want to make sure dollars are following kids to public schools. And that if you're invested in reimagining public education, uh, that certainly is something that we strive to, towards. We want to make sure that um, we have both parties engaged uh, and enthusiastic about the value proposition of charter schools. Um, and then last but not least, I'll just say there are certain, after being around for 30 years, you know, we have some great examples of charters that, that have done tremendous work. There was a study out of PEPG last year looking at NAEP data that demonstrates uh, that uh, students in charter schools, especially black students in charter schools do better long-term on that NAEP test compared to their counterparts in the traditional system. Usually people don't use the NAEP for that purpose. I would usually not use it, but our opposition would use it. So important to highlight this because NAEP is the gold standard. It's not a high stakes test, but the fact that black students in charter schools do that much better in math and English language arts is something to celebrate. There are other studies, of course, randomized field tests and whatnot that demonstrate that charters are effective. But not all charter schools are doing a great job. And we firmly believe that we have to take the quality discussion seriously. And again, there is a law right now. We have to make sure we're serving kids and that we are uh, taking advantage of any and all options that fit students' needs. But at the end of the day, uh, the value proposition behind charter schools rests on the fact that if they're not performing well, they will be closed. And we have to continue making that case uh, if we wanna continue to be in place and a viable, reform option down the road. Thank you, Nina. So what I'm gonna do now is um, 
participate in a uh, Q&A with the members of the panel. Uh, just as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question of a particular speaker or speakers, please submit your question in the Q&A box at the bottom in your Zoom screen. So let me just do three questions, one for each, and then you can uh, respond accordingly. So Michael, you know, I'm married to a lawyer who's also a law professor. And so whenever we have conversations about court cases, I say KISS. Now, naturally, as a good husband, I'm not going to say the K-I-S-S, -S, the S word. My K is uh, K-I-S-H, H is for honey. Uh, keep it simple, honey. So same question to you. If the Supreme Court rules in the favor that you would like, what will it mean for school choice moving ahead? And how should funders think about that opportunity in terms of the diversity? For you, Corey, you work at the state level, you do research, you see what's going on. People are still saying 30 years later that I don't want to support the 18 you know, expansions we're talking about because they're going to lead to segregation, they're taking money away, but more importantly, they're not held accountable. If I'm in a program officer seat or if I'm a trustee of a foundation, I'm hearing from people, what are some of the ways that I can actually respond to that from both research policy and practice? And then Nina, with you in the charter school sector, you've got the bulk of the students uh, who are part of the conversation we have right now. There's still people, as you say, who have no idea what charter schools are. If I'm working at a foundation and I know I really want to get families and alumni of charter schools and others involved, what recommendations do you have for foundation leaders and trustees and officers on how they should think about investing in this narrow moment that we have right now? So Mike, we'll start with you, go to Corey, and then go to Nina. Sure. If uh, if the court resolves this question as it should, it will finally put to rest these issues concerning religion and, and, and school choice. There are some states, as I mentioned, like Maine and a handful of others that take it upon themselves to exclude religious options. Um, but more importantly, and why this case will have such a significant impact, is the fact that school choice opponents consistently attack these programs under state constitutions, arguing that that religious options must be excluded. So anytime a program is passed, you can rest assured that there will be a rush to the courthouse by teachers unions or the ACLU or Americans United for Separation of Church and State saying, can't have religious options in here, shut the program down, or at least get rid of the religious options. If the court says in the Carson case that excluding religious options violates the free exercise clause of the federal constitution, as it, as it should say, that weapon, that argument of school choice opponents will be off the table finally and, and just put to rest. And that is critical because although we've seen such a growth in school choice programs over, certainly over the last year, but in, in recent years, so long as these legal battles are playing out in the courts, there's still a cloud of uncertainty over the programs, which not only you know, raises questions about whether the program will be there for the, for the long haul, but also impedes the growth of the program and might make parents, many parents reluctant to uh, uh, participate in a program that could go by the wayside uh, if a court rules a particular way. So I think that's really where the, the tremendous significance of this case is. This, it has the opportunity to finally put this issue to rest once and for all and to make absolutely clear that these programs need to be neutral toward religion. They need to be open to both private or to, to secular private and religious private options. Now, uh, the last thing I would say is certainly that puts a lot of the school choice litigation to rest. It doesn't it doesn't get rid of all the litigation um, as the general counsel for the National Education Association said uh, years ago in the, the wake of the Zellman decision that I made uh, that I referenced earlier. He says the teachers unions will resort to and these are his, his words any Mickey Mouse state constitutional provision they can find to attack school choice. So the litigation is going to continue. Hopefully the religion question is taken off the table, but they're still going to resort to all these other tactics and will continue defending programs to ensure that families throughout the country can benefit from them. Yeah, I think Michael's right too. Uh, and it's, it's particularly compelling when you point out that the unions what use the con the state constitutions as a weapon to get rid of K through 12 education uh, policies that fund students directly, but then they don't use the that to, to get rid of pre-K programs in states like Michigan and South Carolina. I think South Carolina had had a case recently, but they have a couple of um programs that fund students directly that they can use for 
private religious pre-K providers, and then there's not an issue with that for some reason. So it just goes to show you their, their priorities at and their preference to protect their monopoly uh, and, and do whatever they can um, in, in order to uh, prevent their customers from leaving. Uh, but yeah, I think, look, we, we have the moral high ground when it comes to the arguments on school choice. Uh, the evidence is on our side. The um, logical consistency is on our side. And I think the best way to point that out is to talk about it in terms of funding students directly instead of just calling it school choice because people get lost in the weeds when we say the word school choice. They may not even understand what, what exactly we're arguing for. But when you talk about funding students directly, you can point out the logical inconsistencies on the other side by pointing out that we already fund individuals directly with essentially every, every other taxpayer funded initiative for every other industry. And we do the same thing with other, every other level of education, whether it comes to higher education with Pell Grants and, B, and the GI Bill for veterans. Uh, we do the same thing with um, pre-K programs as well at the state and federal levels. And the same people that support all of those other programs, they only fight against funding people directly as opposed to buildings when it threatens an entrenched special interest that profits from getting children's education dollars, regardless of how well they do, regardless of the choice of the family and what we've seen over the past 18 months, regardless of whether they even open their doors for business. So I think it's very beneficial to change the framing of the conversation. And you can also share the, the polling on this. Um, we should be in line, aligned with the public instead of the uh, special interests that, that want to protect their establishment. Uh, the, I, I, I cited earlier real clear opinion research polling, finding 74% of the general public supporting school choice. And then also there's one by Morning Consult that Ed Choice uh, shared recently, finding 78% of the general public supporting uh, education savings accounts. So they're very popular programs. Um, don't let the narrative from the teachers unions change, uh, change that and make you feel bad about supporting these types of policies that, look, the reality is the most advantaged already have school choice. They can already afford to live in the neighborhoods that are residentially assigned to the best government run schools. They can already afford to pay out of pocket for private school tuition and fees. Funding students directly allows more families to access educational alternatives. So this shouldn't be a partisan issue. It is, it is the issue with a moral high ground and we shouldn't feel sorry uh, we shouldn't apologize for supporting, allowing more families to have access to educational freedom that large segments of the population already have. Um, and then look, you can give them this book that I co-edited with Neil McCluskey at the Cato Institute called School Choice Myths. Um, we knocked down 12 of the biggest arguments that, that are perpetuated by the teachers unions. The biggest one being that school choice steals money from the public schools to which I would respond, the money doesn't belong to the public schools in the first place. It belongs to the families. Education funding is supposed to be meant for educating children, not for propping up and protecting a particular institution, public or private. Pell Grants don't steal money from community colleges just because they can be used at private universities. Uh, food stamps don't steal money from Safeway just because they can be used at Walmart or Trader Joe's. The money belongs to the families, and we should think the same way about K-12 education funding, too. Um, Jared, I think your question was about what funders should do to support us. Is that still the question you want me to answer? Yeah, in fact, and there's yeah. also a question that's linked to that in part. Um, so yeah, so what can funders do to help you? Yeah. And then there's a question that's come up as well, just for you. Has the political fragmentation somehow slowed down the charter school growth? And what are you doing to help navigate? Sure. So um, I, I love that question because as I mentioned earlier, even though there's all this money that's kind of in the system right now to support K-12 education, the thing that will be necessary after the money dries out and it's gonna dry out pretty soon is advocacy. I think uh, philanthropy tends to support and it's certainly in the charter school sector, it's supported the growth of individual charter networks. And a lot of these individuals support these networks the same way a private school donor is supporting a private school or institution. And that's fine. But at the end of the day, you want to set up a system whereby the charter doesn't need this much philanthropy in order to exist because it is a, it is a public school and needs to get 
the same share of funding that goes with kids to traditional public schools. So right now we get on average 70 cents of every dollar that follows kids to a traditional school. In some states or districts, that number dips to about 60 cents of every dollar. In states like Ohio, that number is extremely low. So when people talk about quality and some of the issues that have happened in Ohio, I point to that funding gap as one reason you cannot run something effectively when the economies of scale tilt so much in favor of districts. You can't compete with that system on, a, on an equal footing. So supporting advocacy from the ground up is extremely important. Again, I, don't, I know most people don't wanna support political efforts, but this is a political endeavor. And so being engaged um, at the school board level, city council races, state races, federal races, uh, to the extent folks can do that in their private capacities or have the means to do that, I would encourage them to do so. Uh, but at the end of the day, my hope is that, you know, we will be able to equalize that funding so that we don't continuously go to philanthropy and ask for resources in perpetuity. Thank you. So, um, and on that question about the political navigate, how are you helping with the navigating the political landscape and the the, the factions yes. and slowing down the growth. Well, the, the growth in the charter space had slowed down a little bit at the national level when it came to the overall total number of schools that were opening. We saw an uptick over time. There, there was just a surge in different parts of the country. A lot of it had to do with highly local reasons, but um, we actually did a body of work with support from the Parthenon group that indicated that the reason why this plateauing may have been taking place may have had to do with that the fact that there is potentially huge concentrations and saturation of charter schools in some communities. And one advice they gave us was to try to expand beyond certain jurisdictions. So places again, like Ohio, you can open a charter anyway throughout the state. So our advice really is to expand. The best way to convince someone that a charter school is a good thing is to take them to that charter school so that they can see for themselves what it's doing for the families that they're serving. Uh, and in terms of political fragmentation, you know, there's only so much you can do, but I do think at the end of the day, because the vast majority of the constituents and charters, families who are sending their kids to charter schools, the leaders who are running charter schools happen to be progressive Democrats that really engaging them more in making sure that they are explaining to their fellow Democrats that charters are uh, truly about the community, about bringing the neighborhood school back into the fray and all that is going to make the greatest difference. And we've been trying to do that at the National Alliance quite a bit. Thank you. So we got 12 minutes left. I've got a couple of questions from the audience. So Mike and Corey, consider this one. Uh, with expanded choice, what do we need to fund to help the most vulnerable families? And the second question, this is just for everyone, and this will have to be the last one um, to all. If you were a funder, besides funding your own organization, where would you invest to support families? And what's being ignored by funders that needs attention? So we'll go to the first question for Mike and Corey. I don't want to take it. Yo. This, uh, okay, so so I'm, I'm sorry, Gerard, the first question again being, with expanded choice, what do we need to fund to help the most vulnerable families? Um, you know, I, I think, but a shameless plug for IJ here, you know, I, um, these programs, you know, are invariably challenged, almost invariably challenged. Um, of the six new programs that were adopted this year, we've already uh, seen a challenge to the Kentucky program. We're almost certainly gonna see challenges to West Virginia and some of the other programs. Um, and so, uh, you know, that those litigation efforts, um, you know, require funding. And, and so we certainly appreciate, um, you know, the, the ability that donors make to, to ensure that we can do our work, uh, because at the end of the day, these programs, um, you know, uh, can't serve the families uh, they, they are designed to serve if they are tied up in litigation. Um, so, you know, there's, there's certainly that. Um, also, in, uh, at, the, at the local level, the state level, the many groups that are doing incredible work to get these programs enacted uh, in the first place, I'm thinking specifically of, you know, in, in Kentucky uh, that adopted a tax credit funded ESA program this year, an organization called Ed Choice Kentucky 
um, that did incredible work in getting that program enacted um, on a shoestring budget. Um, so I, I think that's another opportunity is um, the, uh, the folks who are doing the nuts and bolts legislative work to get these programs up and running. Um, I think that it's critical to, to you know, look at them as well, at not just the national groups, certainly you know, the, the national uh, school choice groups are, are vital to this effort, but I think often overlooked are the, the state level groups that are doing the, the kind of on the ground nuts and bolts stuff to get these programs up and running. Yeah, I would agree with that, uh, Michael, especially with, you're right, whenever a program is enacted, the unions will try to weaponize the courts to try to get rid of their competition. So I think IJ is huge. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, to, to get to the heart of your question, to help benefit the least advantaged, any type of uh, expansion of educational freedom disproportionately helps the least advantaged in society because they happen to be stuck in the worst government-run schools. Um, so uh, Nina's group, uh, my group, American Federation for Children, I think these, these are all great groups to invest in. Um, and I, I like something that Nina pointed out earlier that you could, it's a better investment to try to change the laws to tap into much larger amounts of funding to help more and more students than to directly fund the schools themselves. So I'm looking for, you know, towards legislation to expand educational freedom on the part of education savings accounts. So I think that we should be looking at that. And I will plug American Federation for Children. We're the only national school choice, private school choice ag advocacy group that has a C3 arm, a C4 arm, and we have PAC capabilities as well. I think it's a no-brainer funding students directly, uh, informing the public that it's the right thing is important, but informing politicians alone isn't enough to get the job done. You need some teeth as well and pressure uh, because politicians respond to power more so than logic a lot of the times. So uh, a great value add of American Federation for Children is that we can engage in the political work too, not just the advocacy and informational work. And Nina, do you want to weigh in on the, on the broader question of maybe what are some funders missing in terms of helping out with the work? Um, that's not a good question to ask in a, in a discussion with funders. I think, um, you know, when I, started, West. when I started this work, John Walton uh, and, and Don Fisher were alive and they played a big role in leading a lot of the discussions around our organization's formation and whatnot. And so I, in some ways I miss uh, that kind of engagement in this work um, I, from people who sat with you and, 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 um, uh, kind of to help you think through uh, the, the work and the organization in a, in a creative way. Um, so I think that the best thing that groups like the Philanthropy Roundtable certainly can do is to bring funders together to join hands because their collective power is going to have a greater impact than individual funders doing a few things in a few different places. I've often thought, for instance, that if you looked at the map uh, uh, around the country, the majority of funders are focused on certain regions and the greatest concentration of poverty in our country is in the South, but most of the Southern states don't have uh, a great tradition of philanthropy, not all of them, but some of them that have the need for ed reform don't have their own homegrown funders for some reason. And so how great would it be if we could bring some national funders to find these local funders in some states like South Carolina and Kentucky and Alabama um, so that we can actually make a dent. If, again, if the goal is to eradicate poverty and close the achievement gap, looking at those places where those gaps are widest, uh, in my opinion, is a good bank for the buck. And I, again, of course, I'm biased. I think if you want to open options in the public space, the best way to do that, the fastest way to do it is to leverage these charter school laws uh, to attract more leaders to open schools and make sure that they can open in more places than just the few uh, inner cities that they tend to be concentrated in. Thanks, Nina. We've got four minutes left. I got one question directly from Mike. Uh, what do you think the vote's going to be on the Carson case? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, 
I've uh, I've been burned before, so I I I I feel very good about her chances. Look, the you know coming so closely on the heels of of the Espinoza decision, which was a five four decision in our favor. Um, there's been one addition to the court since then, uh, and that is Justice Barrett uh, replacing Justice Ginsburg. Um, I don't want to assume how she would vote in in a case like this, but I you know I I I feel. I feel pretty good having her on the court, um, and uh, you know, perhaps adding another vote to the to the five we got in Espinoza. At the end of the day, though, look, th this should not be a liberal or conservative, you know, either politically liberal or conservative, or, ju or judicially liberal or conservative issue. Um, you know, as as Corey made bef uh, the point before, it's certainly not a, a, a liberal or conservative issue as a matter of politics. But in terms of jurisprudence, the the idea that parents should not be discriminated against because they want a religious education for their children. That should not be a left, right, or politically or judicially conservative or a liberal issue. It's, it's fundamental common sense. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's plain as day that the framers of our Constitution intended to protect the right of all Americans uh, to exercise their faith, to act on their faith, uh, including by directing the religious upbringing of their kids. That should be a fundamentally American principle, and maybe I'm naive, but I'll go with nine nothing in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be a prophet if it comes out uh, <laughs> nine zero. Well, on that note, uh, let me first of all thank all of you for joining us. You know, Michael, thank you not only for your prediction, but thank you for the hard work that you're doing inside the court. You know, the work that IJ is doing, and I didn't realize it was also 30 years ago this month, uh, is changing the trajectory of people, many of them who are low-income family uh, members. And when I run into people across the country, a Cleveland or Milwaukee or a DC or a place where I know you've litigated at the state and federal level, um, you know, I actually sometimes tear up thinking about, they have no idea the work that IJ and people like you play to change their trajectory, to help them move into the middle class, to the working class, and how great that's gonna be. Corey, thank you so much for bridging the gap between research policy and practice. Uh, so often the great research stays at universities, often debated and, and nuanced amongst each other. You're doing that as well, but also bringing it to people, lawmakers, families, advocacy groups, and others. So thank you for the work uh, that you do. Nina, thank you for the strong work and leadership that you've provided in the charter school sector, but really across the whole idea of what parental choice really looks like. And I think the point you mentioned about philanthropy and someone like John Walton and Fisher, who played a role in making sure they were part of the conversation. And you're right. If there's something we could use from the philanthropy roundtable is to be part of the national conversation, but also the state and local where you're located, what you can do to really help navigate this because this is important. If I could just provide uh, just some words of encouragement. Thank you, um, funders, for what you do. Of course, your money matters. But the other capital that matters to, matters to us is your intellectual capital. When I had a chance to work as the president of the Bayo and to work in other organizations, it was actually having funders come in, some who didn't fund us for whatever reason, but who thought what we were doing were important enough. That they would send members of their staff to have conversations with us to talk about strategic planning and other work. So there's ways of you being involved with capital that doesn't involve financial capital as well, but keep up the good work. And I definitely want to say another thanks to now Paz, John Walton for getting together many of his peers who some of us didn't have access to and bringing them to conversations that otherwise would not have happened. Let me thank Polly Williams who played a tremendous role in helping vouchers get started in Milwaukee, but also former Senator Emory Young for her work in Minnesota on charters. You know, let me also thank Dr. Howard Fuller and uh, Dr. Devin McGriff for the role they played in advocacy and bringing public school educators and private school educators to the conversation. We're 30 years uh, into this work, 30 years from now, we'll be able to look back and see that this conversation played a role in moving philanthropy forward to what the next steps are in education. Micah, thank you so much for the invitation. And I turn it back over to you. Yeah, just sure. Thank you so much. And what a rich conversation that we've had here today. And I think the reminder that that Corey made earlier, uh, just on the most advantaged have choice, we're really fighting on behalf of everyone, but particularly those that don't have choice. And so Michael, Corey, Nina, just thank you for the insight. I'm walking away just real quick. I know we're at time. We'll watch the Carson-Macon, hope for the 9-0 coming up uh, on the litigation front. 
Corey, just on the state work and the, all the legislation that's passed, it'll be interesting to see the real life results and what that means for future polling. And then Nina, just all the insight you brought, but particularly on the role of advocacy at the local and state level, much less the federal level that helps keep this all in action. So thank you all today. And thank you everyone that attended. We had a great group and Gerard, awesome job moderating. We so appreciate it. And, and with that, we'll say goodbye for now, but appreciate, appreciate everyone's engagement here.